we'll get started here. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is pretty simple and straightforward. And you probably will have to go through some slides here quick because Maria took about 10 minutes of my time. So, but we'll try to do it as fast as we can and still try to be on time. Um, we have some concepts here that I think it's good for everybody to learn about it. Um, and I told you about for the quantity and nutritive value. I didn't tell you about for the quantity and quality because they are two things different. So nutritive value is something that you measure. It's something that when you send the sample to the lab, they report you with an entity or a, a concentration of a product such as protein, NDF, ADF, digestibility. This is for the nutritive value, okay? And what is for the quality? For the quality is an animal product. So that means it's a combination of the nutritive value with the amount what the animal ate. And that will be converted in animal product. So a forage has good quality if you translate in milk production or um, meat or wool or whatever animal product you are targeting. I'll give an example of a forage that may have a high nutritive value but a low quality, okay? If you have a forage such as you may have um, um, a legume that is a tree legume, so it may have good nutritive value on the leaves, but also may have anti-quality component that when the animal eats doesn't translate in everyday again because it has an anti-quality comp component. Does it make sense? We have forage such as rye grass and tall fescue. Sometimes they can test the nutritive value may be similar. But fescue has an endophyte that many times in the summer doesn't translate in animal gain. That means the rye grass has the same nutritive value as the fescue, but sometimes it has better quality, right? So that is the difference between this concept that I think is, is good to, to learn about when you make some. When you think about quantity and quality, the only thing that we are thinking is about the animal performance, because we know that this animal has needs for quantity and quality, and here is just an exercise that I did some time ago showing you how you change the nutritive value of your hay, okay? And it change if you are targeting the same everyday gain effort, that is the amount of supplement in this, kind, in this uh, exercise here is corn, that is the amount of corn that you need. That means a low nutritive value you need more corn to have the same every day again. And that will translate in cost, right? Right here. So that's why we talk about for the nutritive value because that's pretty much translating animal performance and cost. That ultimately will be the main goal of the purchase. Uh, this is another exercise to show you how that's important for cost. So you have a $50 round bale. Is that pretty close? In the market right now, the bad one, fifty dollar round bale. That's a good roll. In the southeast, fifty dollars is considered a good roll. Yeah, here in excellent. South we're looking at yeah, okay. Seven. Seven This is the guy who works with the numbers, so he's telling the business. <laughs> this is quite quite good. So that was a good example, fifty dollars. So at this day, one has in the end sixty percent. This is that just to be the other one is fifty. So this one is better, right? And when you see the amount of TDN that we have in one pound bale, that is the amount. So this is more energy than this. At the end of the day, you pay the same price for both, right? So on this one, you pay 20% more. And people say that's not much, right? Because one is 0 0.08 dollars per TDN, this one 1.1. So that's not much, but that's 20%. So a lot of people don't make 20% profit in the cattle business, so that may be the difference. So, and we are still promoting for a nutritive value because we still sell hay as round bale or square bale, and we know the round bale is round, and the square bale is a square, <laughs> sometimes, but we know nothing about it. That's what we know, nothing. And we cannot guess. Nobody can guess if that's a good one or a bad one, the only way to do it is testing. That's why we promote testing. 
When you see a Ford like the ones that we saw outside over there, you're going to see that it has a lot of water inside, a great Ford, a lot of water. So we report things on a dry manner because that's where the nutrients are. So that Ford outside may have 80% water and 20% dry matter. That is an average number, but that is usually what it is. When you look at hay, you may have the opposite. You may have 89% dry matter and then 15% uh, water in it because we dry. On silage, it may be more water, 60%, 35% because we need fermentation. But again, when you are talking about for the nutritive value, we talk in, in dry matter basis. And also, you need to be aware that now with the haylage fever that we have, people say, oh, my cattle really like haylage because I put one round bay outside and just disappeared. Sure, it disappeared because it has half of the dry matter. You are putting half of the nutrients outside. That's why the cattle are cleaning up. Because in terms of nutrients, that round bay of haylage has much more water, right? So that's why. And on that dry matter, we have a lot of things. And what we are most focused on, although we may be focused on different nutrients, and we'll talk a little bit about it, but the first one that people want to know is protein, right? I'm not saying that's the most important, but when people look at the soil test, the forage testing, they call you to, to know why my protein is low. And I'll tell you, nobody ever, I have been in the forage lab now for 11 years. We, we started here 11 years ago, and we have people here that help me and send samples to the lab and still do. Like Ed and Bridget and everybody that sends samples to the lab. Nobody, no producer ever called me to tell me Thank you, my forage was really good. Thank you. <laughs> so, but a lot of them call me to ask me why it's so low. Why my protein is so low? That's what they want to know. Why is so low? And do you know my answer? I have no idea. You know, because I don't know, but what I can tell you is if you want to work with us, with your accounting agent and with us, we can have some things that may make your forage with better nutritive value. And we can work together on that. That we can do. But how is that so low? We have no clue. No clue. In fact, you have some, a lot of people that are tricky because, and a lot of people, frequent uh, clients, that they are tricky because they send me the sample that they want to send because they know that sample is good. And that's how they promote their forage. But that is not a representative sample of what they have. It's just a sample for the Ford lab. I need to report the results for the sample that I received. Like Maria said, if you put in a cereal box or a cereal bag, then we have something else in it. But that's what we report. We report the sample, and if people call a lot to complain, that's what we have, is the results for that sample. On the energy standpoint of Ford, we use a lot of the cell contents that are the most digestible and the fiber, because some of that fiber is also digestible. And now we have these numbers that some of you may have seen at school, but they are all confusing because acronyms and abbreviations, they make it very confused. So first one is NDF, that is lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. That is lignin, cellulose, this is digestible, this is partially digestible, this is in theory not digestible. So people think if you have a higher NDF, you have lower intake. That is not true for the forage that we work with. Many times we have higher NDF, but the NDF is a high quality NDF. That means the forage will still be consumed quite a bit. So generally, that is related to intake. But for us, with warm season forage on pasture, that is not the truth. That is a poor correlation. Second one that I'd like to talk about is acid detergent fiber. That is just leaving in the cellulose. After we digest this one, it becomes this one. And the cellulose goes away, and we ended up with lignin and cellulose. And also, in general, in the, in the uh, forage analysis award, they think this is related to digestibility. So they think forages with a lower ADF will be more digestible. That's not true at all. So for warm season grasses, for the grasses that we have on pasture, it may have a correlation, but we'll have a specific forage and a specific range that that may be true. 
and now I'm show you some examples. So if you send a sample to a lot of labs, such as all the commercials that you know, they will tell you the energy based on APM. That's what they will do. As I said, sometimes the correlation between that adjustability and the real one is low because those equations are not really calibrated to warm season forests. They were built for TMRs or sometimes um, cooling. This is Dr. Moore's work, and I think you have seen the whole correlation was 0.5, that is 50% correlation. But then when you look at the tropical grasses, they are kind of out of the equation. And if you look at the natives, even worse. So the, the temper, they are a little more concentrated here. But again, the correlation for us is quite variable. So that's why we don't try to use ADF as a predictor of the DSTV. I did this little trial here at the lab. So I had Spiregrass, 45% 40 ADF, and this is the in vivo digestibility, okay? And I also, and that is a average forage for us. I also have one that was a very good nutritive value forage, 39 ADF, but the digestibility was 64 in vivo. And I said that I got the equations from all these labs, seven labs. And look what was the results that I got from the, from the lab. You can see here, you get some that are really close equations for a forage that has low nutritive value. But look at the high nutritive value. We are underestimating because this mulatto may have fiber, but it may be digestible. So it doesn't work. And you can see when you get warm season forage with good quality or good nutritive value, the relationship is lower. Or when you send to those labs, you're going to get a 55, then maybe a 60. So that's a problem to work with ADM. So that is just uh, the results from 2015 for the lab here, what we received from producers. Um, you can see Bermuda and, and Limpograss are quite popular. Limpograss most come from South Florida and Bermuda come from Central Florida. So those are the results. People don't send a lot of bahia grass because there is not a lot of hay available. The corn silage comes from the dairies. Then we get quite a bit. So but those are the average numbers. Doesn't mean anything for me. But sometimes producers call me and say, oh, is my sample good or bad? Uh, related to the numbers that I bought, I say, I don't know, because it may be uh, good or bad according to your objective, but you have an average here to compare with. So I think if you have a Bermuda grass that is over 10% protein, I think it's above average for us. Uh, around 11, 12, we get good samples, but we also get a lot of bad. So, and this is one of the questions so on the quantity standpoint, why we talk about for the quantity? Because then I start with nutritive value to get to the most important issue, to finish with the most important thing, that is for the quantity. So if we don't have quantity, we don't even have the opportunity to talk about quality, right? Because there is nothing there. For sure, the animal will not gain any weight because there is nothing there. So that's why we talk about quantity. And we know the quality or performance the most influence, influential um, sector here is intake. Intake is related to herbage mass, herbage allowance. So if the animal can eat a lot of forage, they can gain more weight. If there is no forage to eat, it may be really good, but they will not gain a lot. Of so intake is the main factor. And then you have digestion. And then you have metabolism of the animals. This one for us is really important software much more than people think. When we have an animal here, a growing animal, and they go in the summer, we use the models from the NRC or the Cornell, and we can predict this animal with the diet that we offer to gain about two pounds a day. When we put the animal in the pasture during the summer, wet, mosquitoes, water standing, we have the same diet, these animals will gain half of them. So 
It's because we have a lot of heat stress and uh, animals are not comfortable. So we have seen that over and over. So some people don't really believe the, perf the low performance that we have in growing animals. Mature animals, they have lower requirements, so we don't feel that much. But growing animals, this section here is really important for us here. But nonetheless, for the animal to gain weight, it needs to have forward intake and needs to have one. This is just a little exercise like we did. So that's how we measure. It's really uh, time consuming, a lot of labor. So sometimes it's not very practical because people don't like force. So how, how can we, we do that? So this is different forage quantities. Those are different scenarios. And we have seen this graph before, right? If you have more forage or lower stocking rate, you can have the animal gaining a lot of weight. When you put more animals in the pasture, you have more competition, less availability. So the gain per animal go down and the gain per area, because you have more animals gaining weight, will go up to a certain point. If you work here, we are always in bad shape. And that's where we have probably 80% of our producers doing, working around here. So we lose animal performance, we lose faster, and we have a lot of weeds. And we have few of them working here, primarily people that develop efforts or they have pure bread animals. And there is an optimum rate here where we can balance both. This is just real data to show you with uh, Bahia Bresam Lava. We increase the stocking rate, we decrease the gain per animal, and we have the same shape for gain per area. And these are the pastures that I use to show you those graphs. This is under stocking. This was, in, in our model, the best, because it gave you that higher gain per area. And this was overgrazing, and it's pretty simple to see. And this is a different study, but I just want to show you how that hurts. So when you have jigs pasture that were undergrazed or overgrazed, this is undergrazed, this is overgrazed, because this is number of animals per hectare, and you can make the calculation per acre, but that is the number. And you can see here, at the end of two years, those are the proportions of gigs that we have in the stand. So we lost a lot of our forage because we overgrazed those pastures for two years, really short. So to make it practical, the forage quantity aspect, what we need to do, just to adjust the stubble height. So if you can see the dung piles, you can see uh, your feet on the ground, you can see things on the ground long ways it's because you are overgrazing and now you don't have a quantity. That's pretty simple. So if you manage the stubble height many times to the right, you don't need to be measuring and harvesting and weighing. So you can keep the persistence and the production of the grass. And this is my last slide. That is some of the recommendation that we have for different species. And I think they are pretty, pretty good in order to optimize the production and nutritive value and the persistence of the grass. So remember the, the thoughts from Dr. Pate that I always like to say. In Florida, there are two, two types of grass. Bahia grass and the ones that will be Bahia grass. Okay? <laughs> Just two types. So it's because everybody's grazing at three inches stubble height. As you can see at three inches, it is a stubble height for Bahia grass. So if you graze it too short, that's what you're going to get. Bahia grass, some places you can get common Bermuda, that in my opinion here is where it is worse than Bahia grass. So common Bermuda will be worse. So you can have one of both or some other thing that I'm not desiring. 